Is he a good finance minister for the German people? No. No? No, no, no. He's uh, well, a he's very the, bad... He's, besides Merkel, the most uh, mm, famous, no, uh, but most popular politician in Germany. He must be, he must be doing a great thing. Uh, why do you think I'm not impressed by this? So what? Popularity and uh, competence do not go hand in hand. Oh. Um, look at history. Look at the last 300 year, years of history. Uh, at the peak of their popularity, uh, many leaders uh, were grossly incompetent and inimical to the interests of their people. All right, young and naive, we're in Berlin, but you're not a Berliner. Everybody's a Berliner in Berlin. Yeah. Absolutely. JFK said so, didn't he? He did. So, so, what kind of Berliner are you? A radical Berliner. What kind a, of, a troublemaker. Really? Absolutely. What kind of trouble do you make? Well, ask Wolfgang Schäuble. <laughs> <laughs> Does he know who you are? You haven't, you haven't introduced yourself yet. Well, I'm Yanis Varoufakis. I'm the failed finance minister of the most bankrupt European state. Mm -hmm. And as such, um, I had fun negotiating debt relief with Wolfgang Schäuble. We're going to talk about him later. Tell us, okay. uh, you've been a politician or minister for six months? I was minister of finance for six months. Um... What would you do differently? I would be tougher. Tougher? I would uh, bring things to head in the second month of my tenure rather than the sixth. Why didn't you do that before? Because I was under the false impression that my government was behind me and would have been behind me six months later. But they were not. Well, didn't you talk to the head of your government? That was it. We had an agreement. But you know, politics is the realm of backstabbing. <laughs> Really? Oh, you're surprised, are you? Yeah. <laughs> you're not as naive as that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so t t tell me about the backstabbing. Well, it's very clear. We had an agreement mm -hmm. on the basis of which I, I, I never wanted to be a politician or a minister, but um, uh, the Alexis Tsipras, who was the leader of the opposition at the time, uh, agreed with my recommendation on what should, be, should happen and how we should approach... Greece is um, um, just awful situation of being effectively in a debt prison. Mm -hmm. uh, I've put forward some suggestions to him as to what he should do, mm -hmm. uh, what his government should do if he were to get elected, how he should uh, deter the European Central Bank from bullying his government, closing down his banks, uh, and what kind of proposals we should be putting forward. Very reasonable, moderate proposals, but proposals which if accepted, would allow Greece to breathe again. Mm -hmm. And he came back and he said, this is all great, but I want you to do it as finance minister because I don't have anyone else to do it. And that put... You, you, you do the dirty work. Well, that's fine. Oh. Somebody has to do the, the, the dirty work. And okay. since, you know, for many years I was criticizing previous governments uh, on what they were doing and proposing alternative courses of action, it's only right for someone like him to say to me, well, put your money where your, mo your mouth is. Right. And there, at that point, I had the, um, the ethical, if you want, uh, uh, dilemma. Uh, do I do it or do I not do it? And I felt that I had no alternative than to say yes. Mm -hmm. Because when, you know, once in a lifetime, this opportunity arrives at your doorstep to do that which you've been preaching uh, for, for years, right. uh, I, I think that it would be an act of cowardice to say no. But I made it clear. I said, I will only do it. On two, con two conditions. First, I get elected. <laughs> that is, I need a democratic mandate. I'm not going to be a technocratic finance minister like all the previous ones. And secondly, we will agree that I will only do it if you, if you and I shake hands that we will do A, B, C, D and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So we had this agreement. Uh, well, as the weeks and months went by, uh, the backstabbing happened. I would do my battle as According to the plan, to the agreed plan, with Mario Draghi of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, Wolfgang Schäuble here in Berlin. But members of my government, uh, with the approval of the Prime Minister, would go behind my back, telling my uh, adversaries, uh, don't listen to him, we are not going to let him do it. Hmm. So it's a bit like David going to the battlefield against Goliath, finding out that the catapult has been removed <laughs> from his belt. Not much chance of defeating Goliath if if your even your little catapult right. has been removed. So that's the backstabbing I'm, I've been referring to. So what did you learn about politics that you haven't learned before you were a politician yourself? Nothing. Oh. 
it's it's a dirty business. I we all know that. Everything happened as you expected, or uh, no? Not everything happened as I expected it because I believed falsely that our small team, who were elected to change the course of our countries and indeed Europe's uh, illegitimacy, uh, that we were united, but we were not. Is there anything that you could tell other um, upcoming politicians to look out for? I mean, there are young, a lot of young people who watch this who want to become a politician, maybe like you, who don't want to get backstabbed. What do they do to not so that won't happen? Greater openness. Uh, okay. Transparency is uh, the only antidote to political shenanigans. Really? Uh, I wish there was a camera uh, everywhere. Everywhere we were in our, the meetings in the Prime Minister's office, in the Eurogroup, so that people can actually see what's happening. You want to surveil government action? Absolutely. I want government to be transparent and uh, citizens to be opaque. Now we have the opposite. We have opaque government and transparent individuals. You want live streaming of like Eurogroup sessions? Absolutely. We have campaigned. DiEM25 has been campaigning for live streaming of all Eurogroup, ECOFIN, European Union Council meetings. Because this is where decisions are being made on behalf of everyone right. without anyone knowing what's, how they're being made and what the, these decisions actually are. Right. This is pathetic. I mean, I mean, there are like German parties, like the Pirate Party, who um, we agree with them on this, and they agree with us, well, with we, us on this. I mean, they they did live streaming of their uh, when when they talked among each other mm -hmm. uh, about what to do, and that led to um, backstabbing uh, in the background, or they found ways to not mm, discuss things uh, Look, while while live streaming. So I, I don't believe that every discussion should be live streamed. Okay. Uh, di discussions the purpose of which is to est establish a common line, uh, can be private ones and informal ones. But when you have represent elected representatives meeting to legislate, to create decisions and law effectively, that rules over people's lives, mm -hmm. that's when you need to have live streaming. Now, of course, they will have discussions behind closed doors before they go into the room where the live streaming is on, but that's okay. Uh, I didn't mind having a private discussions with Wolfgang Schäuble uh, to see what room there was for a common ground that were private. That's fine. But when we go into the Eurogroup, which, which is a body of politicians representing different countries that will make a decision that determines the future of Europe, um, at that stage, uh, if you don't have transparency, which we don't have, mm -hmm. You and all the citizens here in Germany and in Europe generally will only be informed through leaks, mm. which cannot be corroborated. And, and, and then the agenda is well, controlled the, by the media. There are press conferences. Schäuble goes before the press and yeah, he tells and us everything that happened. Do, don't you believe you, him? Do you? I'm naive. Well, firstly, he doesn't tell you everything that happened, even by his own account. Mm. He comes out with a two, three liner out of a 10 hour meeting. So it's not the, as if. He's sitting there giving his, his... And anyway, why should you believe Schäuble or me? Why shouldn't you be able to have eyes and ears listening to what is happening on your behalf? Mm -hmm. uh, so I do, be, I, I, I'm, I do not believe that we, you should have no in, informal meetings, but the actual meetings where after all the informal discussions, your representatives are there speaking on your behalf, and this is their final position on the matter, and a decision is being made, you've got an obligation to demand that you know what is going on. Have you ever talked to Schäuble about it? Like, hey Wolfgang, let's live stream this. Nope. Why not? Maybe he would have said yes. Maybe he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, well, firstly, because we were talking about other things. Uh, like, for instance, um, I'm not going to sign on the dotted line of another loan from you, mm. uh, even if you kill me. <laughs> that was more pertinent to our conversations. I wish that was live streamed. Uh, and he would say to me similar things and very interesting things. We never reached the point, and this is a troubling feature of Europe. We never have a discussion in Europe about democratic governance. We never, we never do. We never talk about the crisis. You know, all those Eurogroup meetings, which are about the Euro crisis, right. never concern the Euro crisis. You talk about the Greek banks, the Greek debt, the Irish banks, the Spanish banks, 
what are we going to do with uh, the, the French national budget deficit? But we never talk about the crisis. How are we going to firefight this big crisis which is consuming Europe? Mm. This is astonishing. I mean, to compare and contrast Europe and America. In America, they have, they have these conversations. Right. They are pragmatic people. Whatever you may think about them, they're highly problematic. But nevertheless, they are pragmatic people. They have the right conversation. We don't have the right conversation. So you're right. I mean, we should have had this discussion. Of course, if I had said, I want this live stream, he'd say, yeah, right. <laughs> um, do you respect him? Absolutely. He didn't Why? respect him. He, didn't, he, he respected me as well in our private meetings, but not when he spoke to the press. I was respectful towards him every time I spoke about him, even to the press. Really? Yeah, absolutely. You've never heard me say anything disrespectful about Schäuble ever. So you, I, I, I urge you to find any quotation of mine about Schäuble, which was disrespectful. I disagree with him, but that's not, not lack of respect. Is he a good finance minister for the German people? No. No? No, no, no. He's, well, uh, he's very the, bad. He's, besides Merkel, the most uh, mm, famous, not, uh, but most popular politician in Germany. He must be, a, he must be doing a great thing. Uh, why do you think I'm not impressed by this? So what popularity and uh, competence do not go hand in hand. Oh. Um, look at history. Look at the last 300 year, years of history. Uh, at the peak of their popularity, uh, many leaders uh, were grossly incompetent and inimical to the interests of their people. Can you, can you explain why he's the most popular yes. uh, politician in Germany? Because he, is, uh, he does what populists do. He plays on the prejudices of, of the average German voter. And the prejudice is, what is a prejudice? Um, I'm not, this is not a criticism of Germany because that's what pol populists do everywhere, in Greece and France and Portugal and Germany. But since you're asking me about right. Schäuble, uh, th there is this quaint view that um, uh, Germany has the right economic model and everybody else has the wrong economic model. And if everybody becomes like Germany, the world will be a better place. Exactly. Which is wrong. Oh. Because you cannot possibly have a 9% trade surplus with everybody else, while at the same time admonishing the rest for having a deficit with you. It really, you know, a 10-year-old will tell you that this cannot work. So the only reason why Germany is doing well out of this crisis is because everybody else is in crisis. Uh, and in the end, the crisis comes home to bite you in, in the bum here in, in, in this country. The reason why your pension funds are being crushed, why your small banks are insolvent, why you have negative interest rates and the IFD and the xenophobes are growing in strength is because of what's happening in the other countries and that's because of Schäuble. So Schäuble tries to um, blame it on Mario Draghi and the European Central Bank for uh, keeping interest rates very low. Yeah, but this is like shooting the postman because you don't like the, the content of the letter that he brought you. Uh, Draghi is simply the postman. And the cause of the bad message is Schäuble's policies. It is ridiculous to imagine that you have a, 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 a sustainable economic model in Germany on the basis of every, everybody saving. Okay. Here you've got corporations that save. This is ridiculous. Corporations should borrow to invest. Here you've got net savings by corporations, Siemens, Volkswagen, they have savings. They're it's, great companies, that's why they say. It is ridiculous that great companies borrow to invest. Because you see, look, you obviously need some, some economic education here. Allow me to be arrogant yes. for a second. Yes. Um, the idea is that families save and firms borrow. If everybody saves, who's going to borrow? You're going to have a glut of savings, which you do in Frankfurt. And when you have a glut of savings, you know what happens? The price of money goes down. That price of money is the interest rate. That's why you have negative interest rates. It's not because of Draghi. It's because you have a failed economic model in Germany. Uh, you don't, not like Greece, as failed as in Greece. But the failures of Greece and the failures of Germany go hand in hand. Because think about it. If everybody in Germany is saving, yeah, they will need to lend that money to someone. Who saves money that is not lent is wasted money. So effectively, by having a massive trade surplus with the rest of Europe and the rest of the world, you are forcing yourself to be sending your savings to foreigners. But then you can't complain that the foreigners borrow from you and they are in deficit. If you do that, you are arithmetically illiterate. And Schäuble, as a finance minister, is illiterate. But he likes being illiterate because he gets a lot of power from this oh. um, obstinacy when he says, 
the rules are the rules, but the rules don't work because it is impossible to stabilize the Eurozone economy on the basis of rules that are against the basic forces of gravity, right. of economic gravity. Right. Um, so he's very good for propagating in the short run um, dominance of the German government within the Eurozone. He's very good at that, at the expense of the long-term prospects of the people of Germany. So you're a game theorist. Can you explain what game does Schreiber play? Uh, you don't have to be a game theorist to explain that. No. He's, he plays the, a, a very frustrated game. Uh, he is um, convinced, with some justification, that he should be chancellor. He is livid that he's not chancellor. And he's using the finance ministry to do that which he wanted to do as a chancellor. That's the game he plays. What game did you play? Oh, very simple. Um, escape. <laughs> the, um, escaping debtor's prison. We are a country that is in a prison of debt. Uh, we have um, a bankrupt can um, state, a ban bankrupt government, bankrupt banks, bankrupt companies, and bankrupt families. And the, Europe, in its infinite wisdom, official Europe, is pretending that you can solve this by giving us more loans on condition that we shrink our incomes. Mm -hmm. Now, a 10-year-old will tell you that this is not going to end well, and it's not ending well. Yeah? So the only way of escaping this debtor's prison is by insisting on, uh, on, on, on two main very basic ideas. Firstly, you need to have a, a debt write-down. Because when you are bankrupt, you cannot get out of your bankruptcy by borrowing more money. You need to have a debt restructure. This is what companies do in Frankfurt all day, every day, every day. They restructure their debt with their lenders, with their banks, with but, Deutsche Bank. But Greece is not a company. Oh, but it is an entity. Every entity um, that is bankrupt has to restructure its debt. This, this is a given. You know, there are very few certainties in economics. One of them is this. If you're bankrupt, you've got to restructure your debt. Otherwise, you're dead. That's it. You're finished. So take General Motors in 2009. Had a huge debt. Why is it alive today? Because they restructured, restructured the debt up front. First you restructure the debt, and then there's a chance of survival. Um, that is the case whether you're General Motors, a corner store, or Greece, or Germany for that matter. The only reason why there was a German miracle in the 1950s is because your debt was written down, written off in 1953 in the London Conference. Mm -hmm. So debt relief is essential for escaping that was prison. And Germany benefited from that as a, as a result of concerted effort by the Americans to have your debts written off. So my job, my game was very simple. Escape from debtor's prison. But you lost. Yes. And look at the result. The result is that Greece is worse off today than it was two years ago. And it will be worse off two years from today compared to now. And as a result of that, uh, Europe is losing legitimacy and the bigots, the racists, and the neo-fascists are the only beneficiaries. So if Greece is worse off than before, um, didn't you make it worse? Absolutely not. No? Look at GDP today and compared to the GDP that I left, it's lower now than it was when I was in, in government. I tried to do the right thing. I was confronted by an ironclad set of creditors that were not very smart at getting their own money back because by increasing further our tax rates in a country which has no profits. Uh, our capacity to produce the, the monies from which we could repay you folks uh, was reduced. Um, and yes, I was crushed. Uh, we were crushed, but to the detriment of the people of Germany and the people of Greece. Is Greece a sovereign country, a sovereign state? No. 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 Absolutely no. We don't have a government. We have something that looks like a government. But uh, we are being. Let, let me give you an example. None of the members of parliament that last week voted in favor of the new bailout terms and conditions agreed with them. None of them. Not one of them. Not one of them. The opposition who voted against them uh, would have voted for them had they been in government, and yet they didn't agree with them either. Right. So in in a, in 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 a republic where the whole of the parliament, the whole of the parliament votes for something they don't believe in only because they are at gunpoint by a central bank, which says to them, if you don't vote for this, we'll close down your banks again. Right. That is not a sovereign nation. It is a nation in a state of brutal occupation. Who's the occupier? 
uh, the deep establishment of Europe, which uh, uh, comprises, if you want, the Franco-German banks that were bailed out um, in the name of Greece, because the bailout was not for Greece, it was for Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, Finance Bank. These are the people who were bailed out mm. by the money that Greece... So your money went to the Greek state and then immediately to Deutsche Bank. So they were bailed out uh, in the name of solidarity with Greece. Right. So the, the, the banks, uh, the bankrupt banks, and they're still bankrupt, by the way. You have a serious problem in this country with Deutsche Bank. It's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's an awful institution uh, kept alive by Schäuble, effectively, uh, at your expense, at the expense of the citizens of, of Germany. Mm. But that's another story. So you have the banks, then, then you have uh, the bureaucracy, which um, lives in Frankfurt and in Brussels, whose uh, positions of power, whose incomes, whose stature, whose chance of getting a, a job with Deutsche Bank or Goldman Sachs a few years down the track depends on perpetuating this, the, the, the same, extending this crisis to the future while pretending that it has been solved. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, various uh, corrupt elites in Southern Europe, in Greece, in Italy, and so on, that have their own power being reinvigorated by these loans. Uh, and so, you know, this is a deep establishment which thrives as a result of policies that are detrimental to the vast majority of Europeans, north, south, east and west. So, who are Greece's allies in, in, in Europe? Who were, who were your allies? Are there other governments who, who agree like, hey, we should change the Eurozone, like we, we should change the rules? No. No. No, no allies? No. There Still was... no allies? Even today? Macron no. or something? Well, Macron has the right idea, but let's see in practice. But if you remember that um, François Hollande agreed with most of what I said to you t during this interview mm -hmm. before he was president. Mm -hmm. And then he became president and then suddenly he, he, had, he, he had an acute case of um, amnesia. It all disappeared from his mind. And he behaved uh, like Mrs. Merkel's uh, um, you know, uh, underling. Uh, hopefully Macron will not do that. But it's very hard to see given that he does not have a, a political party behind him that gives him substantive power within the National Assembly. Right. Let's see what happens in the June election, but I don't see it happening. That he can um, say no to Merkel and to Schäuble. He wants to. I, I believe he does. Because he's a smart man. He understands all these problems. Is he going to be a lame duck president from day one, or is he going to be something more than that? I fear that he's going to be a lame duck president. But look, the problem here is this. We have, remember the Soviet Union? Hardly. Well, you've read about it. You've seen mm -hmm. movies, right? Yeah. Oh. Well, the Politburo, which was like the Eurogroup, comprised all these apparatchiks, who were smart people. They were not dumb. Yeah? They all voted in unison. They had these red cards and they would raise them every time there was a proposal. That was the Eurogroup. They all vote. None of them believed in what they were doing. All of them could see that this was situation, situation was unsustainable. If any one of them dared speak their mind, they ended up in the gulag, even though everybody agreed that they were right. This is Europe for you today. If they know it's unsustainable, the whole Eurozone, mm -hmm. why do they keep sustaining it? What what's the interest? Just like uh, staying in power? Um... Uh, yes, it's 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 the fear of retribution by the rest. If each one of if any one of them stands up and speaks what everybody else agrees with, mm -hmm. uh, it's the it's the, the the it's herd behavior. It's like the sheep that all go together, right. and each one of them fears that if they leave the flock. Uh, they will be singled out. Like you? Well, I didn't mind. So, uh, do you think... My job was not to stay in the flock. My job was to go in there to do a job. The moment it wasn't possible, and they rounded around me, and um, they went for it. I was happy to fight until I dropped out of that flock, and now I'm in another flock. I'm a part of the Democracy in Europe movement, um, and... Uh, we are, with DiEM25, trying to do that which our great and good leaders have spectacularly failed to do, to bring together Europeans on the basis of an agenda that is sustainable. So let's finish um, 
with German elections are coming up, mm -hmm. is the best hope for Europe that Schäuble uh, gets kicked out of the government? The best hope for Europe is that you all join the M25. Uh, and we do that which is right. And we speak the language of uh, common sense and uh, uh, some kind of subs subservience subservience, subversiveness of this wall, wall to wall obf obfuscation and uh, inanity. The problem is that the SPD is uh, dedicated to repeating everything that Merkel and Schäuble have done, but call it something different. <laughs> Uh, the problem with the link is it's heavily divided. The problem with the Greens is that they are heavily divided. What we need is a new alliance of progressives, independently of whether they are part of this party, that party, or the other party. So, effectively, we should split up every single party and reconfigure a progressive alliance that speaks truth, truth to power and does that which is right by the citizens of Europe as a whole. Because this idea that, you know, there is the Greeks and the Germans, that the German interests are against the Greek interests and vice versa, is toxic. It's another version of the 1930s. It is the greatest enemy of truth and progress. That doesn't sound so good. I think it sounds splendid. Let's all get together and do what is right by Europe. Let's uh, get together some, some other time. And I, I want to live stream a debate with you and Schäuble. I'm happy to go along with that. You've got to convince him first. <laughs> I'll try. Good. Thanks. Good Thanks so much. Thank you.